Good morning. Uh, welcome to the second day of Chardon's Genetic Medicines and Cell Therapy Manufacturing Summit. Uh, I'm Gula Lipschitz, and our compliance team has asked me to read this statement uh, for uh, today's uh, session. Uh, but by participating in this event, our speakers attest that they have made Chardon aware of any potential conflicts, and they will not discuss any material non-public or confidential information that they're aware of that may breach their legal, regulatory, or fiduciary responsibility to any party. So with that, Done. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kennard Patel, uh, President and Chief Operating Officer of Rocket Pharma. The format for the session is roughly a 25-minute fireside chat. And if you have any questions in the session, feel free to type them into the question box. So, Kennard, thank you for joining us. Uh, to start, could you please discuss Rocket's manufacturing capabilities and strategic approach across your ex vivo and uh, in vivo modalities? Yes, and good morning, and thank you so much for having me. It's always fun to talk um, with you at the Chardon conferences. Um, so Rocket has a wonderful pipeline of six programs that are preclinical or clinical, mostly in the clinic, across ex vivo NT, and those are the late stage assets that we have, um, two of them approaching BLA, and AAV programs that are Dan and Bean the lead program in approaching phase two, and other programs in IND or approaching IND. So our strategy has really been staged appropriate gated. So what that means is when we started as a company about eight years ago, we ended up having an XVIVO Lenti portfolio. And at that time, we made a strategic decision to use commercial grade CDMOs across US and Europe and partner with them from day one. Our goal was really simple. Let's make sure every patient treated or on our therapy gets the highest quality therapy and highest quality commercial product. This way we can also decrease time to approval meaning decrease the need for comparability or extra studies. Dark's View Valenti has been well underway with commercial grade plasmid, vector, and cell processing, as well as centralized analytics across Europe and US. So we've kept that really with the CDMOs because it, we feel, it feels the right thing to do and it feels like it's working well, given that multiple of our programs are heading to BLA about four years after just getting into the INDs. That's a great place to be. Our AAV manufacturing, we have a great partner that we worked with as a CDMO for phase one product. However, we realized for Dan and disease to treat really 15 to 30,000 patients, US and Europe, this is something that we're gonna have to do in-house or with partnerships. And given the amazing talent pool that we have in-house, Rocket decided to invest in building an R&D facility in Cranberry, New Jersey. This facility encompasses over 50,000 square feet of manufacturing space with in-process QC testing, pilot program to go all the way from two liter scales to 800 liter scales. So AAV is really done in-house and we can really bring new, new programs and new ideas into the assets um, in our platform approach, apply it and quickly get into tech transfer mode, IND, as well as hopefully to a BLA. So both programs have different strategies and I think it honestly based on uh, where we were in the life cycle of Rocket, <laughs> investment purposes, um, as well as our, our expertise and the partners we have. Oops, I can't hear you. I think, um, sorry. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> CDMOs have recently uh, amassed considerable expertise in cell and gene therapy manufacturing uh, over the the recent years, um, but there have also been some instances of setbacks at partner sites among a number of programs. So how does Rocket minimize the risk of issues at your partner sites? Um, we have a great relationship set up with them. The CDMOs we're using are really commercial grade, top notch. They have been inspected by FDA or EMA. So that also helps tremendously for us to de-risk. The second thing we do is actually we have person implant. So anywhere from two to four Rocket team members are on site when we're producing um, our patient material on site. And that allows us to do things and, and really deal with the one-off chances of, of something going wrong, which tends to happen a little more now than we'd like to think. Um, but having expert team members right there working hand in hand with the CDMOs really make it easier. The third thing we do is sometimes for a CDMO, their talent is not directly in contact with patients, right? And it becomes a kind of a mundane job that you do over and over in a clean room dressed up in for 12 plus hours. So what we do is we actually share patient stories with them and we participate in their town halls to tell them about the impact of the product they produce at their facility going to little kids and how the kids are doing. I think all of those components have made it easier and for us to work with them in a very efficient um, collaborative manner. Mm -hmm. So I guess 
for both uh, modalities. Um, can you expand a little bit on how you decide what elements to develop internally versus what can be manufactured or outsourced? Our goal is really that um, we want to maximize the science. So all of the process development, scientific expertise, we try to keep in-house with amazing talent pool we have and bring in even more um, high great talent that is really curious, but knows how to move and innovate the field. So what we've done is things from basic things like potency assays that people think are easy to do sometimes are challenging. So we develop our assays and analytics in-house, and then we tech transfer them to the CDMOs. So all of the process optimization activities we try to do in-house and then tech transfer them in for repetition and quality and control. So we tend to just be closer to the science versus the actual manufacturing floor. Um, for AEV, however, we do both. And I think we're really glad that our process development team is sitting in the same building as our manufacturing team, as our R&D team. And that allows a seamless knowledge transfer, but also allows a um, more efficient way to really problem solve any challenges that could arise. Great. So as you mentioned, Rocket is nearing regulatory submissions for two ex vivo ND programs. So can you walk us through a little bit about what the manufacturing process for this entails? And then we have a couple of follow-up questions on that. Sure. So our LED1 program, um, leukocyte addition deficiency, this is a program that was created to treat patients with severe disease. And unfortunately, about 60 to 65 percent of the kids die by the age of two without a transplant. So severe unmet medical need, no other treatment options available. Only few that are lucky enough may get a bone marrow transplant, and it has challenges associated with them. So this program, from day one, we had a commercial grade plasmid vector cell processing and analytics set up both across US and Europe. And this program is heading towards a BLA this quarter. Oh my God, <laughs> we're in April already. And so this quarter is going to the FDA for the BLA. And our goal there is really get patient mobilized, collect their product over two to three days. And then we actually do cell processing within three days. And then we cryo the program product. And we cryo the product until we have all the analytical release criteria available and also meeting the criteria, including everything from potency assay to for D and DS and DP, but also VCNs and other key components to predict the vector is intended to do what it's going to do. And we see that in the analytics. And then we infuse it into the patient um, once the tests are available and we have the final product released. And these are really truly individualized medicines that are created with patient material and the vector. And it's, it's beautiful to see its impact to patients. When gene therapy works, it really works. This program has had 100% survival. Um, success across all patients. All patients have gone from frequent hospitalizations, antibiotic use to being antibiotic free and no hospitalization post and living a normal life, going to daycare and going to school. So it's remarkable what's been done with these patients. So we feel that CMC component um, that trips us up in many instances, we've had that under control for LED1. For Fanconi anemia, the uniqueness about Fanconi anemia, also ex vivo lenti, Fanconi has two components. One, the cell biology is a bit unique. What that means is it has one selective advantage, so we don't actually have to condition the patient before we give the product back to them. And the second, it's because of the cell biology, it's also fresh, fresh product. So from mobilization and collection, so when we do collection Monday, Tuesday, we produce the product Wednesday, Thursday into Friday, and we actually infuse the patient by Saturday. So within a week, a patient is infused with the product. They've just gotten the cells. Um, they give the cells and it goes right back. So vein to vein, it's less than a week. And that's quite impressive. We believe this process works really well for these patients. Of course, in the future, we'll think about should we do cryo or not? For the product for cryo in and cryo out we'll consider that right but right now the clinical data is so promising and these patients are doing well without any use of conditioning the safety profile is quite clean so we're taking this to commercialization both in us and europe um, with cdmos in place in both regions under the same umbrella uh, and with comparability and analytics um, pretty much set and, and agreed to with the fda and the ema so kind of building on that last point that some autologous lentiviral gene therapies have achieved regulatory approvals, but then there's also been peers that have faced delays specifically due to CMC questions. So what are you focusing on to try to ensure that things go smoothly for your program? Um, I think the, the investment we made, and thanks to our wonderful investors, ben, uh, our executive team and the board of directors, we've had a commercial rate lockdown of the program from CMC perspective as much as possible from the IND 
first patient treatment onwards. So that allows decrease. If you have a decrease in CDMO changes or process changes during it, you can have decreased chances of comparability need or other challenges associated with it. I think that has helped. The second component is every step of the way, thanks to having RMET designation and the prime designations and other bells and whistles like orphan and, and pediatric rare disease designations, we've been able to engage with FDA and EMA every step of the way. Sometimes patient by patient activities, we've engaged with them in order to ensure that everything we're doing from a CMC perspective is absolutely on par in incorporating their recommendation every step of the way. And I think an advantage Rocket has with its deep pipeline is when we learn something on a discussion with FDA on PKD, we apply it automatically to Fanconi and LAD, right? So having multiple programs also allows us to learn from one interaction and apply to the other platforms. And I think that has really helped us decrease the, the risk usually seen in CMC. Mm -hmm. so on that front, uh, in terms of what you've learned from your interactions with regulators. Can you talk a little bit about what they're looking for with respect to process and uh, product characterization at this commercial level? So it is changing over time. What we what they were looking for in 2017 has absolutely evolved, right? The pendulum has swung in a more concerted manner, which I think might be a good thing. So we'll see where the balance is. But what we've seen is, you know, potency assay, having a functional potency assay is absolutely critical. And while sometimes in cell, uh, cell and gene therapy five years ago, we would think about having something in place, but really thinking about it more at phase two or pivotal phase three, we're starting to do that earlier and earlier. So by the time we submit an INT, we actually already have a potency assay in place, ready to be qualified and or qualified. By the time you start a phase two to make it really be pivotal, we're, we're actually validating that assay. Um, and, and that's a big you know, thinking of CMC after the fact is never a good idea in cell and gene therapy. So CMC is something that is no longer an afterthought. And we have to think about it the minute we have a product that could go into the clinic. I think that's number one. The second thing we've seen is FDA and EMA, they are scientists, they are physicians, they are pharmacists. So it's all about the science and the data. So when you talk and present your proposal, providing a scientific rationale, whether it's the disease biology or um, the experience you have across your platform um, with a mixture of what is feasible in the unmet medical need patient um, population, I think they're open to those discussions. So I would say, don't be afraid to push the envelope and, and think about things because for Fanconi anemia, for example, we do a two-step release. So we release the product and infuse it even before we have the final COA ready. And we were able to get agreement with both EMA and FDA, given the unmet medical need, the cell biology, and the disease condition, that it made sense. So what I found is transparent data trans driven discussions with health authorities really make a big difference. Got it. And so in terms of um, commercial supply, are you and your partners a position to supply the commercial market? Um, and as a follow-up, do you anticipate that further scaling might be needed for subsequent programs, such as at PKD, which does have a larger population? Um, at this point, we are ready to support with our CDMO partnership, both for Fanconemia and LAD. PKD is approaching phase two end of this year. Certainly by then, we can apply a lot of the launch activities and successes or challenges from Fanconi and LAD and apply to PKD. So I think by the time we have PKD in the market in the next two to three years, we should absolutely have the enough supply chain um, because the CDMOs we work with really have the capacity across Europe, U.S. and different parts of the world to allow the, the tech transfer to happen more efficiently and to make these products available and accessible to patients in the region of need. Great. So let's turn to AAV. Um, so you mentioned Rocket is positioned to start its pinball trial in Dan and soon, um, and you'll be using product that's manufactured at your facility. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and uh, how the in-house product uh, compares to the product that was used in the phase one uh, trial? Certainly. Um, I, as I think about this, it just makes me smile so much because a lot of um, <laughs> A lot of hours and love and passion has gone into building the in-house manufacturing facility. So our facility at this point, we have successfully produced two CGMP um, products in-house. And what has been wonderful about this is we found that these two programs have, uh, sorry, these two productions have allowed us to not only increase um, the number of patients we can treat, almost 3x the number of patients per batch that we're able to treat, but also we have a higher full MT ratio and our comparability has shown that we're comparable to the phase one product and certain things have improved, which allows to be, have a better safety profile. 
So we're really excited about getting these products infused into the patient in the next few months to come. And, uh, you know, our team is anxiously waiting because they've spent so much time uh, designing, tech transferring, but also producing and scaling up and releasing the products. A lot of, a lot of passion and love's gone into this. So we're waiting to infuse the first patient with this amazing product. So what changes uh, have enabled the improvements that you talked about with respect to yield and purity? Um, we've done, we have an amazing process development team in-house. And they figured out some filtration steps and some optimizations that were needed in both upstream and downstream that just allows us to have a better um, purity and, and better uh, up, output of the product in a more consistent fashion. And I think that's been really the, the secret sauce <laughs> that we're proud of. And so what have you learned regarding the, the key analytics that um, you need to look at for to ensure that product quality and purity and consistency? Analytics, I think the good thing is because of our XV Valenti learnings, um, working with the world class um, CDMOs and world class academic um, experts from the US and Europe, we were able to apply a lot of those analytics learnings with that in house. And our experts in house, um, led by uh, this guy who's just an amazing analytics person, um, has really designed analytics to fit for use both from a stage appropriateness. So what we need for phase one versus phase two versus getting into a BLN commercialization. And the second component specific for actually disease or product of nature. And, and those specificity has allowed us to, on one hand, have a platform approach that we're proud of, that we can apply certain analytical tests, whether it's XV or NT or AV, certain tests are the same for in-process testing, release, et cetera, like the VCNs and other things. And others that are more specific, he's applied really the scientific rigor to allow it to be more product specific. What we realize, and I think what I keep echoing over and over, it's um, analytics is really the bread and butter of everything, right? You have to have your analytical tests properly set up, executed, and those analytics really allows you to see if you can have an apples to apples comparison. So as much as possible, decreasing variability by being operator independent, um, being able to replicate it over and over in different labs. I think that has been really key to success of ensuring that you have a strong analytics. And we've been able to demonstrate that for our DANA program, but also for our Exuvalenti programs. And a lot of learnings from that are being applied to a future program like the PKP2 going into IND this quarter and back three that's being developed for an IND early next year. Got it. And so premier discussions with regulators, again, kind of echoing a similar uh, topic that we just discussed for the Lenti programs. Uh, can you talk about what they're looking for with respect to the AAV gene therapy CMC at the pivotal or commercial stage and at, as opposed to at the earlier stages? Yeah, a um, couple of things they're looking for is they want to make sure your, your facility is built to be inspection ready, right? So because we knew we were going to use the cranberry facility to supply both the U.S. and Europe GAN and patient supply in commercial stage, we made sure it met the regulations and regulatory requirements both for the EMA and FDA. So I think that was key number one in designing the infrastructure and the build out of the facility. Number two, they're looking for um, ensuring that you have comparability and comparability not just at large scale, but also small scale. So we've been able to show that comparability at 10 liter scales, but also at 800 liter scales and the data shows consistency. And the third thing they're really looking for is for the phase two DNM program to really be called pivotal. Um, we've really um, had to spend quite a bit of time in making sure that we have a functional potency assay that's predictable and validated and ready to go. So those are the three things that I think specific for not just having in-house manufacturing, but also making sure that it's considered a pivotal study. So you mentioned that you know you'll be able to take some of the learnings and some of the work that you've done and apply to the PKP2 program. That program does use a different capsid. So to what extent did you need to tailor a new process uh, for that program versus using something similar to Danon and and you know more broadly in terms of efficiencies do the programs share equipment and, and other components? Um, surprisingly, a lot of the raw materials that are qualified for Danon um, apply similarly to R74 backbone as well. So that's the good thing. There are quite a bit of synergies across actually XV and AEV, whether it's AEV9 or R74. Um, and we've found that uh, it's actually more advantageous because we can negotiate better with the, all the raw material needs across all the programs, but also some of the equipment are the same. So the bioreactors we use for AV9 could also be used for R74. So that synergy absolutely helps. The other synergy that helps is analytics. The analytical tests we do, for the most part, are the same between these two platforms of AV9 and R74. So a lot of those learnings we've applied. 
And I think I have to give credit to our process development team is just amazing with our working with our great CDMO in partnering, being able to keep things as similar as possible between the two programs, but where there are differences is because really there's going to be an impact from a science perspective and, and from the vector perspective. And those impact understanding them upfront and being able to articulate what changes exist and why has really been the 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 thing that has helped us have better engaging discussions with FDA and making sure we get their buy-in on the platform approach that we're applying across all of our AEV programs. Got it. So um, in terms of scale, is your current capacity at your facility expected to support uh, both commercial products? And you know, in terms of uh, expansion, uh, what is the capabilities to expand scale further? Um, it's definitely set up to uh, supply all of 15 to 30,000 DNN patients, uh, for sure. That's the cranberry facility. Given that we have two more programs added and that are publicly known and more in the works, um, you know, either we do this multi-platform approach within the facility, or we can, you know, Cranberry, New Jersey, uh, fortunately has a lot of green land around, a lot of farmland. We could just expand. And I think the lessons learned of building out one manufacturing facility, I think we've, we've learned a lot. So we could probably do this over and over, uh, faster, better, cheaper. Um, but, you know, those are things that I think we think about two years down the road. Our ph philosophy is really simple. When we see clinical proof of concept, we invest in the next gating factor. So at this point, we've made a full investment into DNA and also doing small scale activities for other programs that are ideas. So that way we can go from an idea discovery all the way to an IND in less than two years in-house. And I think that's going to be the great thing that's going to apply to our future wave two programs that are not publicly known. But other programs, as we get more clinical data on PKP2, we'll consider whether we want to bring that in-house or work with the CDMO. And these are great questions to ask ourselves because that just means that product's working and making a difference in these patient lives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. So just stepping back from your specific pipeline, what do you see as the biggest challenges in cell and gene therapy uh, space relating to CMC? I think the biggest challenge is, is honestly, these products are right now being discovered, manufactured, and being ready for commercialization in US and Europe. How do we think about regions beyond it? Because patients aren't limited to just to these two regions, right? We have a lot of patients with Ganon disease and Fanconi anemia, for example, in Japan, in Australia, New Zealand, all over the world. So how do we actually make this something that's accessible to patients around the world? I think that's the big challenge. And how do we do it in a, in a more cost-efficient manner? I think it's going to be based on having just more and more therapies available. The cost of goods should come down and we can do this and replicate it a lot more easier. So I think scaling up and making it accessible to patients um, is probably the biggest challenge. The second is how do you make it where it's closed loop, right? End to end. Um, I think if you have that, you could decrease the chance of potential contaminations or need for things like RCL testings and all of those components. And I think the third thing which already exists is getting knowledge be shared so that we will not each sponsor and each IND is discovering its own new thing again, right? So one of the conversations that I'm having with um, FD on panels, wh uh, whether it's through the organizational panels that we have through, you know, um, different associations, or it's actually through the ARM organization, Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, is how do we apply platform approaches? So we're not doing the same mice studies, preclinical research, all of that to show the vector from small scale to scale up over and over every single time you have a new concept or new idea or new disease you want to target. So what do we do to make it more efficient to share the optimizations and learnings? And I think if we can do that, that would tremendously help um, both from a CMC perspective, but also drug development perspective. And so in just the last minute or so, are there any innovations that you're particularly excited about on the CMC front? Um, I've heard a lot of cool things that are going on. I, I can't wait to see uh, if some of them come to fruition. Uh, one of them is really just making portable. Um, so having like a essentially a van or a machine that you can take and do the cell processing, that would be really cool. Um, and you can take that anywhere and that would be great. Also being able to see if we can do infusion of patients at outpatient setting versus actually in hospitalization. For fenconinema, we think it might be more likely to do that if we just make a little more tweaks to the CMC process. And so... Um, whether it's capsage or scaling up or just having more pure com uh, product coming out, more consistent quality product and less variability, I think all of those things are innovations 
different people I talk to have different ideas, whether they're scientists with PhDs in process development or analytics or manufacturing team members. So I think honestly, we're in the forefront of innovation. What we learn, we plan to share with the industry and with the agencies, and hopefully we learn from others in the field that are actually innovating as well and, and keep growing. Um, our goal is to make CMC not the big hurdle that a lot of people face, but really make it where we are growing biologics nowadays, right? When the drug works, it works in biologics. You don't think about CMC as much. And I'm hoping that we can get there for even selling gene therapy products. Great. So on that note, uh, I think we've reached the end of our session. So I'd like to thank you again, Kennery, for the great discussion and the overview. Thank you so much. It's fun always <laughs> to, to talk to you and thank you for having us at Sheridan.